I'm so hugely excited to hear Jay Smooth. Okay, check one, two, can you all hear me? Wow, okay, this is um, daunting. Um, so it's definitely an honor to be here. Thanks to Andy and Andy for uh, hooking this up. I've really been inspired by all of the talks I've seen already, inspired enough that I rewrote about half my talk last night. So this might be a little disjointed. But my name is Jay Smooth, and I do a video blog named Ill Doctrine, basically an ongoing series of video commentaries where I try and make a case for human connectedness and compassion and make that sound a little less corny than it did right there. Um, and I cover a lot of different topics, and the focus has kind of shifted over the years. Um, it started out being focused mostly on hip hop culture and the hip hop news of the day, um, because hip hop is my background, as he mentioned. And um, because there were so many uh, musical interludes, um, yesterday I was inspired to throw a little something in of the kind of thing I used to do. Um, so this is just a little snippet I'm gonna put on of uh, five or six years ago, Bill O'Reilly had this thing where he kept antagonizing rappers for no reason. He kept doing segments about Nas, and I had a theory that Bill O'Reilly was obsessed with antagonizing rappers because he secretly wanted to be a rapper. Um, he, had, you know, he has the perfect sort of ego and bombast for the job. So um, around this time, I uh, took a Nas song named Major Look and rewrote it um, as if it was in Bill O'Reilly's voice and he was uh, you know, rapping about what a great propagandist he is. So this is just a little snippet of that video. Now let me distort your perspective with my invective, then pretend I'm objective. Y'all appointed me to serve injustice, kick like a steel toe. Y'all know it's built on my tactics are trifling. When I attack for the right wing, run up from the back, push the knife in. Up in my no spin zone, I rock your bells like a ringtone. Call you prehistoric like Flintstones. This ain't journalism, this is Fox News. You need a plan for some slander, I got you. Propaganda, I spit like hot poo. And that stand named over man's getting got to. I know you've seen Colbert Jack and my swagger, but now I'm back in the lab. And the fact of the matter is that your rally factor is fatter. The facts don't matter. If I lack more data, I just pack more chatter. And when you see me debating and screaming and hating, it's only succeeding and making all of my ratings get fatter. He's lying. Ha, made you watch. In my game, you're a pawn when I'm on Fox. Getting big because I mix all your minds up. Where my dies at? Where my neo cons at? A rap, a rapper. He is the biggest win. Gangster rapper. Gangster rapper named Bill, Bill O'Reilly. This guy is not ridiculous. He's despicable. Shut up. Okay, so, so it goes on a bit from there. <laughs> um... So I used to do a lot of things like that, um, but over time I, I gravitated more and more towards touching on broader issues around politics, media, pop culture, and eventually it just became sort of a free-form blog where I yell at people about being nicer to each other. Um, and so the, the process is usually I see some sort of, something in the news or when I'm surfing the web, some kind of media stimuli that just seems so wrong and unjust and assholey that I start yelling at my laptop screen, and that's when I know it's time to pull out the camera, and I take about 12 hours to take that something, someone is wrong on the internet rage and crush it into a diamond, and then I take, I take that rage diamond and put it on YouTube. Um, so, <laughs> so some of the more popular ones have been um, how to tell someone they sound racist, um, a beginner's guide to saying no homo, spoiler alert, just don't say it, um, and all these sexist video gamer dudes are some shook ones. Um, <laughs> so I've been doing this for about six years. Um, it's been the most rewarding creative work I've ever done. You know, this, something about this medium really touches a chord with people, um, and it's let me have a small part in public discourse on a lot of issues I care about. Uh, my videos have become a part of the curriculum in a bunch of high schools and colleges, which is very validating for me since I went to no colleges. Um, so I've been doing that for about six years, but the reason I'm able to do that and have the blessing of people wanting to pay attention when I speak is that way before Ill Doctrine, way back in 1991, um, when I was still in high school and Jay Smooth seemed like a cool name, 
Um, I, started, uh, I started a radio show named uh, The Underground Railroad. Um, a hip hop show on a community station in New York named WBAI. And uh, I was blessed as a kid growing up in the 90s to play a part in New York's underground hip hop scene, help to develop it, um, get to meet most of my heroes and have them relate to me as peers. Got to give a lot of my favorite artists some of their first exposure in the scene. I'll show you a few pictures. Young, young Questlove, young Q-Tip, very young exhibit. <laughs> he had no rides to pimp yet at this point. Um, and it was through that old media space and that connection with the music I loved that the painfully isolated, shy kid I was back then found a voice and a place in the world for the first time. And everything I get to do now is uh, because of how hip hop gave me that voice. So I just want to talk a little bit about some of the lessons I've taken from my lifelong intimate relationship with hip hop and uh, how I try to represent the spirit of hip hop as I knew it in my work talking on broader issues with Earl Doctrine. And uh, one thing that always struck a chord for me with hip hop, which I think resonates with uh, what a lot of us do here, is uh, hip hop from its earliest days was based on trying to harness technology and creativity in service of community and human connections, and specifically trying to hack and subvert the technology of the day in order to carve out space for the underdog and for the outsider. And um, I think most people know the basic story, hip hop's origin story, you know, it was in the South Bronx when nobody had anything and we cobbled together this way to get our voices out there. Um, but I think most tellings of the story underestimate um, what hardcore tech heads all of these hip hop pioneers were. Um, I mean, I think people know about, you know, subverting the turntable into a percussion instrument and isolating the break, MacGyvering the street light into a power supply for the party, but that's just the tip of the iceberg of all the sort of hardcore gearhead maker fair activity that was going on um, with all of these guys who, who started the scene. There's a great documentary I wish I could show you a snippet of, but it's like impossible to find, named Founding Fathers, that has lots of great interviews with the DJs before Cool Herc and Flash and Africa Bambata, sort of the disco DJs who uh, made up the primordial soup that gave birth to hip hop and they, you know, they were out in the park jams. And you get such a great insight into all of the obsessive geekiness that went into trying to jerry rig these unbelievable homemade sound systems that were gonna blast the crap out of the neighborhood and the park. Um, and I should say, just as an aside, disco as a whole also has a, its own history as sort of a subversive community building thing. You know, a lot of disco's origins were in uh, needing to figure out how to make great sound systems in a private loft space because city ordinances would not let the predominantly black and brown gay community at that time dance in public. Like people of the same gender couldn't dance with each other. Um, so a lot of those innovations of people like David Mancuso building sound systems in those lofts is also something that hip hop's uh, development traces back to. And another little tech hip hop crossover early on. One of the most important DJs um, in that primordial soup was a guy named DJ Plummer um, who used to do park jams out at Jacob Reese Beach. And uh, in the mid to late 70s when hip hop really started coalescing, he missed out on it because he left DJing to work at Bell Laboratories and become part of the, one of the first Unix systems development groups. So that, <laughs> that's one of the first hip hop tech crossovers back in the day. So there was a whole lot of nerdy techiness going into the innovation of hip hop. But one thing I think is maybe a little different from a lot, I think in new media, a lot of times we sort of invent a new microphone and then figure out what would be cool to say in it. But this innovation back then was born out of a human need. You know, there was a necessity uh, for people to find a space. It, it's like uh, Molly said yesterday, people who had real world obstacles uh, sociologically, economically, to be able to express themselves needed to cobble together a way to do that. Um, and so hip hop carved out this space where the most invisible people in the most neglected corner of America could come together and form a community around this dance and music. Um, and hip hop has gone on to do that in communities around the world, from the favelas in Brazil to being a soundtrack to the Arab Spring in a bunch of different countries. I'm sure you're familiar with these things. But also on an individual level for me, for a lot of people like me, I think hip hop was uniquely suited, just like it 
gave a haven to underdogs and outsiders on that macro level. For an introverted, isolated kid like I was, hip hop, I think, was uniquely suited as a pop form to give me a haven. And I hate to introduce myself as an introvert, because now when you say that, people think, oh, you're those people who keep making listicles about yourselves. <laughs> That's great. You're so unique and special. Thank you for helping me understand you. Uh, so I, just, just for the record, we didn't write any of those. We didn't ask for that. The, the, the number one sign that you're an introvert is you think BuzzFeed should mind your business. But, <laughs> but that being said, I was a very introverted kid. And my circumstances growing up kind of turned it into an unhealthy thing where I was really isolated. And um, I was most comfortable just hiding somewhere with a book or a record and diving into some wormhole of esoteric minutiae. And hip hop was perfect for that. It gave me the perfect haven because it's kind of like how people say baseball is the perfect sport for nerds because it generates so many statistics. Hip hop, just first of all, there's so many more words to latch on to and memorize and find hidden meanings in and cultural references. And then every beat that they're rapping over is the beginning of a scavenger hunt. You have to go find where did this sample come from, where did that sample come from, and then you look at the line of notes of the record. So it's just endless, an endless world for me to lose myself into when I was growing up. And then when I got to do my radio show, it uh, gave me a real life community to be a part of with people who shared that passion. Um, so I've always tried to uh, embody that and, get, and sort of represent that spirit of hip hop both with my work in hip hop music and uh, outside of it in El Doctrine. But the tricky thing about that lifelong commitment to paying hip hop back and uh, being true to that inclusive spirit is that your childhood passions don't always grow old gracefully with you. And hip hop over the years has internalized some of the bad habits of the society it started out providing a refuge from and developed its own forms of inclusion. So being a grown up hip hopper who's committed to a lifelong relationship means learning how to walk a tightrope of loving this thing and sticking with it while hating certain aspects of it. And that's uh, been one of the biggest challenges for me over the years is figuring out how I can challenge things within the community and call people out. I hate to even use the phrase call people out. That's become really loaded. But um, challenge people in the community while honoring my connection with them instead of throwing it under the bus. Um, and that's something that came up most powerfully for me in about 2005. There was on Hot 97, the big commercial radio station in New York, they played this horrible parody song about the tsunami um, that had occurred back then named uh, the Tsunami Song, which was a version of We Are the World where they systematically listed every ethnic group that had died in the tsunami and made these horrible racist jokes about them. I mean, it, like a musical parody of We Are the World is just aesthetically offensive in and of itself. <laughs> And then, but this was so beyond the pale offensive. And they were playing it every morning on their morning show. And this is back when I was textually blogging on hiphopmusic.com. So I heard this and felt like someone from in the hip hop community needs to say something and just have it on the record that we don't all think this is cool. So I put up a blog post about it and I put a link to it on uh, Questlove's website, okplayer.com. And it immediately touched a nerve where. Eight hours later, the next morning, it had spread all around, and um, Hot 97 put out an apology that morning, but it was one of those, we apologize if you're offended apologies, that just made people even more mad. So, it, oh, so I just kept hitting it and kept inviting people to join in. And after a few days, it picked up so much momentum that we were in City Hall meeting with city councilmen, and I had uh, reached out to a friend of mine named DJ Cutting Candy, um, and asked her to bring in activists, both from the hip hop and the Asian American community to work on it. So it became this movement over the next month or so that um, ended with Hot 97 giving a million dollars to a tsunami charity, a couple of people getting fired, which is sort of like a street level drug dealer getting arrested. The, you know, this, the people higher up are gonna put some other shock jock in. That doesn't really have an impact. But the part that was really valuable to me was all the connections that were made from uh, trying to make hip hop as inclusive as it can be. A whole bunch of connections were made between these Asian activists and hip hop people that uh, you know, continue on to this day. And I think it showed a lot of people how powerful it is, um, how powerful a tool the internet is to be able to mobilize people really quickly and make those connections on an issue. Um, so, and it was pretty soon after that that I started Ill Doctrine and basically 
tried to pick up that challenge of uh, on broader issues of race, class, gender, and what have you, um, figuring out how to walk that adult hip hopper's tightrope of uh, challenging people while also honoring uh, my connection to them. Um, so I just want to show a quick example of that. Um, this is another video where I uh, try to speak out on a serious issue, which is, uh, is sort of a statement of solidarity with a very underrepresented minority group, which is people who hate uh, Christmas. Happy holiday! Happy holiday! Happy holiday! We're a good six weeks deep now into the telling everybody to have a happy holiday season. And the closer we get to the end of that season, the more urgent the need becomes to tell everyone everywhere to have a happy holiday. Even though at this point in the year, that's probably the least useful thing you could say to anybody. Pretty much anyone you run into this week, you can be confident they already know there's a holiday taking place and that they're expected to be happy when this occurs. So instead of me telling you to have a happy Happy holiday for the 411th millionth, 800th millionth time. I'd rather take a minute to acknowledge everyone out there who's not having a happy holiday. Everyone who can't be with the family that they love. Everyone who has to be with the family that they hate. Everyone who can't afford to express their love through the season's mandatory rituals of crass consumerism. I see you. I know that you're out there. I know that this is the most stressful, most depressing, most unhappiest time of year for millions of people. And I know that if you're one of those people who's already unhappy, happy, and then you got to spend six weeks having everyone else come up to you like, hey, have a happy holiday. I hope you're having a happy one. Don't you go wearing a frown. What are you, some kind of Scrooge? Is something wrong with you? Society demands that you be happy. If I'm one of those people who's already unhappy, that is not helpful. That makes it worse. If I'm not having a happy holiday, it isn't because I forgot to do it. I don't need you to remind me. I'm already acutely aware of my failure to be happy. And well, I mean, let me just pause for a minute and say, I'm not mad at people who say happy holidays. I say it. We all have good intentions when we say it. But I also know that for a whole lot of people, this holiday season is like a little box that you know everyone's supposed to fit into. And you wish that you could fit in the box too, but you just can't fit in the box. And when you can't fit in that box, it makes you feel like the whole purpose of this holiday season is to remind you that there's something wrong with you. So I just want to say to everyone out there, no matter how you spend this holiday, there's nothing wrong with you doing that. And give a little love to both sides of that holiday divide. For everyone out there who is able to have a happy holiday, good for you. I'm sure you're already on top of it. Keep up the good work. And to everyone else out there who's not fitting into that happy holiday box, I especially want to send this out to you and let you know I see you. There's lots of people right there with you. I've been there and you're not alone. Basically, I just want to say that wherever you are, whoever you're with, whatever your circumstances, happy holidays are optional if you're into that kind of thing. Okay. So I was going to stop here, but I have an addendum or two that I added after seeing yesterday's speeches. But as, anyway, that's not as heavy a subject as I usually get drawn to, but that's basically what I strive to do is uh, reproduce those core aspects of hip hop that meant so much to me, that carving out space for the outsider and the underdog, shedding some light on some places where people's position in the game is uh, being overlooked and finding that balance of how we can challenge each other both bluntly and with compassion. And I want to say everyone doesn't have to be as diplomatic as me. I mean, I think it is necessary sometimes, especially if you're one of those outcasts or outsiders. You, sometimes you just need the boundary setting and the catharsis of telling somebody off, no matter how it makes them feel. And that's equally valid. I don't want to negate that. But whenever I have the chance, I'm drawn to the challenge of trying to find that balance of checking people while also you know, showing my respect for them and their humanity. And I want to follow up on some of what Molly said in her speech yesterday and say, in addition to a healthy appetite for challenging each other within our respective scenes is really important. Something I've learned the hard way from a lifetime in hip hop. You need to be introspective on a personal level about what you might be perpetuating without realizing it inside uh, your circle. Because um, I've been doing my show for 22 years, this is a picture from about 10 years ago, and you might notice, like many new media events, there's a room full of dudes. Um, it is yet another all-male panel. And um, I've been doing my radio show for 20 years. For most of that time, I just kind of took for granted that if I'm a fair person and I'm picking the best person for the job to add to the team, that's the extent of my responsibility. And if it 
just so happens that everyone is a dude, then what? That's not on me. That's, I don't know, that's just the way it is. Um, so it took me a long time to really grapple with and take accountability for that not being good enough. And that um, if I don't actively make it a priority whenever I have a choice point where I can do so, if I don't say I am making the priority to get more women in my circle, that dynamic will perpetuate, even though none of us intends to perpetuate it. We all have a natural tendency to perpetuate the exclusion we inherit and being blinded to our role in it. And I think it's easy for all of us. I mean, one way or another, a lot of us are in new platforms that we're hopeful will create some utopian meritocracy. It's easy to be complacent in that and uh, blind yourself to how you're repeating the same old patterns. And it's really worth it just... <laughs> and just, just from the standpoint of self-interest, it's... And I had a longer rant about this, but I'm already over time. It's worth it just in terms of self-interest because um, those sort of unexpected, random, magical connections that Adrian talked about in his... Uh, thing about his guitar work, like that's, there's just mathematically more chances that will happen if you're opening up more lanes and letting more people on the playing field. I want to tell one more story real quick um, about how the little piece of yourself that you put out there, hoping that it'll connect with other people and uh, add up to something bigger and more richly human in some of its parts. If you're doing the work to try and open up lanes for it to travel, that can come back around, back, come back around to you in ways you would never expect. So just real quick. Um, 1973, there's a song named Shaft in Africa by Johnny Pate. Um, it's a minor hit, not a huge hit, but a few years later, when hip hop is building that space for the people in the South Bronx to come together, this is one of the biggest tools in their arsenal. Shaft in Africa becomes uh, one of the main breakbeats and b-boy anthems in the canon. Um, so, fast forward, uh, 30 years later, one of the uh, people that I solidified a connection with from my work on the Tsunami song was a writer named Jeff Chang um, and an activist, great, just great person who did an awesome book named Can't Stop, Won't Stop, you should all read. And when he put that book out, he also put out a mixtape with a bunch of the songs from those early days, including Shaft in Africa. We're getting to the sort of humble brag, name droppy part of the story. So uh, he gives me a few copies of the mixtape then um, a little bit later on, I'm hanging out with the producer, Just Blaze, who uh, produces Jay-Z, among many other people. And I give him a copy of the mixtape. We're sitting there listening to it. And he gets up to uh, Shaft in Africa. And we get up to this part of the song. And Just Blaze stops the CD and starts rewinding that part over and over again for about five minutes. And I'm thinking to myself, what, Just Blaze is making a beat right now because of me. So that happens, then I forget about it. Then a year and a half later, um, Jay-Z's new album is coming out. Um, and this is the first, the first single. So this is not a connection that you would ever naturally make, but if it wasn't for Everything that led up to that work on the Tsunami song and you know, those little efforts to try and make connections that you know, my little contribution to hip hop history wouldn't have happened with this Jay-Z song. But that's not even the good part. Um, a few years after that, um, Just Blaze gets a phone call, and I'll show you the tweets that uh, he put out when this happened, from the artist, uh, Johnny Pate, um, who made the song Shaft in Africa. He called Just Blaze on the phone with a shaky voice. and. Um, said that he had just turned 88, living on fixed income, and had gotten a huge check from this song getting sampled. <laughs> and Johnny Pate, he didn't even know that the song had become a b-boy anthem in the 70s, much less everywhere else it had traveled. Um, so yay for samples. And um, <laughs> to me, that's just a beautiful example of how when you put that little bit of yourself out there, it can travel around the world and across generations and come back to you in ways you could never see coming. And it's worth trying to make whatever scene you're in as inclusive as it ought to be, just so that you have the best possible chance of incredible shit like that happening to you. Um, so that's, that's basically my be nicer to each other rant. It's been a great honor for me to be here with you all. I hope we all keep making good stuff. <laughs>